everyone. So this paper is on the generalized bounds on the conditional expected SS return on individual stocks. And it's got out with Fuseni Chabio and Grigori Vyuko. So I'm very glad for your audience today and I'm looking forward to your helpful feedback on this paper. By way of motivation, um, expected returns are very important for investment decisions and they are also very useful for testing um, economic theories. However, we know that it's very hard to estimate expected returns of individual stock from historical data because of the limitations we have from time series data. Also, even if one goes to high frequency, um, we do not improve estimation of first moments. Even if one assumes that historical data is more or less good enough and decides to use factor models, um, it doesn't quite solve the problem because there we still have issues surrounding several anomalies from factor models. In recent times, several papers now try to use information from option prices because we know that option prices contain a lot of world looking information aggregated from several market participants. This literature has mostly focused on estimating the expected SS return of the market from the risk neutral distribution. There is an important contribution from Martin and Martin in 2017, who derives a measure of expected SS return for the market as the discounted implied variance. Chabio and Lodis in, in their 2020 paper in the JFE also derive a bound for the expected market return when the, when the SDF is unknown, and they also provide a close from expression of the expected market return when the SDF is a function of the market. In an important paper, Schneider and Trojani also, de also derive bound on the market using the minimum variance SDF approach. Now, our paper is focused on estimating the expected conditional expected SS return for individual stocks. And here, there are only two papers that have tried to do this using inform information from option prices. And these papers are Cardan and Tang, 2019 RFS, who derive a bound on the conditional expected SS return for individual stocks as the discounted implied variance. Martin and Wagner in 2019 also have an important contribution where they derive expected SS return as a function of the stock implied variance and the implied variance of the market. Now, in this paper, we try to extend this direction of research by providing a generalized measure of conditional expected SS return for individual stocks that accommodates higher order moments of the risk neutral distribution. Now we know that um, higher, order moment, higher order conditional moments are highly sensitive to disaster risk and are therefore important components of expected returns. Now, what you see here is a quick summary of what our measure of, law, of the lower bound for the expected SS return of individual stocks are, is. And you see that it is simply a ratio of two risk neutral moments quite very easy to estimate from the data provided you have the cross section of option prices. You can estimate this for any investment horizon. And we also show that this generalized lower bound, which is what we call our measure of lower bound because it accommodates higher order moments of the risk neutral distribution, has um, strongly depends on skewness and kurtosis and the, and the effects of these higher moments are conditional on the state of the aggregate economy. We also analyze whether the generalized lower bounds are an unbiased proxy for the expected SS return of individual stocks. And we see that for the vast majority of stocks, this lower bound can be used as a direct proxy for expected return itself. We also show that these lower bounds outperform competing benchmarks in out of sample prediction of individual stock returns. And they also perform better than the variance based bounds of Martin and Wagner as well as that of Cardinal and Tang, 2019. Now we take our measure of expected SS return for individual stocks to a number of economic applications, and we show that there is, um, the expected SS returns of individual, stock, of individual stocks is highly sensitive to monetary policy news. We also show that um, the number of cross-sectional determinants of expected returns, which is, has been shown in the literature, but we show that when you use our measure of expected returns, characteristics such as market beta, um, you know, 
Characteristics such as market beta are well priced in the sense that we do not have the low beta anomaly or low risk anomaly that has been documented in the literature. We also derive implied preferences that produce the out of best out of sample performance for our generalized lower bound. Now, here I summarize the two main papers that have, de that have derived um, expected return measure for individual stocks. This is the measure of Martin and Wagner, 2019. And you can see that it is a function of the implied variance of the market and the difference between the stock specific implied variance and the average cross sectional implied variance of individual stocks. The measure of Cardan and Tang you see here is the discounted implied variance of individual stocks. Now, to, to our theory. We begin with, a with the assumption that the non-arbitrage condition is satisfied. This assumption allows us to have guaranteed the existence of a, st a strictly, strictly positive SDF, which prices assets in the economy. And we take a simple return, RJ, over horizon T to cap T, and the SDFM. Now we take an arbitrary derivative defined as this function. And using the basic pricing equation and the definition of covariance, we have the following identity. Now, if we rearrange this equation and use the Radonikodin theorem to move from the risk neutral um, to the fiscal, dis fiscal distribution, we have the following equation for the conditional expected excess return of individual stock. You see that this equation is a sum of two terms. One, term one, which is um, risk neutral expectation, ratio of two risk neutral expectations, and a second term, which is in the fiscal measure, which is not observable. This first term, one can easily compute from a cross section of option prices. Now, to derive our bound, to derive a lower bound for the conditional expected excess return for individual stocks, we try to sign this second term, which we cannot compute, by defining a set of theta so that this covariance term is negative, then we focus on this term and we know that this term is a lower bound, given that this second term here is negative. Now we assume that this theta set defined in the previous slide is not empty. We show later that indeed this is satisfied in the data and we try to find the maximum lower bound by trying to maximize term one for the set of theta defined previously. Now, this maximum lower bound for the conditional expected SS return of individual stocks we call GLB. And the cool facts about this measure is that, as you can see, and as I also mentioned earlier, it is quite simple. One can estimate it as a ratio of two risk neutral moments of degree theta plus one and degree theta. Now, the other interesting thing is that one can write, can using, using Taylor series approximation, one can show that this term can be written as the weighted sum of all higher moments of the risk neutral distribution, where the weight is defined as follows. We show this for illustration purposes. <clears throat> now, how do we determine the set of theta that guarantees the lower bound? We need a, some less restrictive, restrictive assumptions which is first that we are in a one period economy and that that is a representative agent, such so that the SDF of the representative agent is, marginal, is proportional to the marginal utility defined as follows. Now, if you take this marginal utility and substitute it for M in the set of theta and use a second order Taylor series approximation, we find that this set of theta can be written as follows. Now, this set depends on a number of parameters, namely theta, I mean, namely betas, some preference parameters, gamma and rho. Now, these preference parameters are basically, gamma is basically the relative risk aversion um, coefficient, and rho is half relative prudence. Basically, rho is the preference for skewness. The, the betas are a bunch of covariances that we compute under the P measure. Now, having defined the set of theta, we can now compute 
the rich neutral moments that are in the numerator and the denominator of our GLB bound. And these rich neutral, moment, these rich neutral moments can be easily computed using the spanning formula of Bakshi and Madan 2000. And here we show the expression for computing those. And basically, once we know the set of theta, we try to compute these for all theta in the, in the, in the set of thetas that gives the lower bound. And we take the maximum generalized lower bound for this set of thetas. Now, to the empirics, we use a bunch of um, sources for data. Basically, we use option matrix data for um, volatility, option matrix data for op option matrix data for volatility surface for maturity 30 days, 91 days, 182 days, and 365 days. We also take um, firm fundamentals from CompuStat, returns from CRISP, and we also take factor returns from the from, um, from Kenneth French website. Now for the estimation procedure. First, we need to know what preference parameters gamma and rho to use to compute the set of thetas that give the lower bound. For a start, we assume that these preference parameters are equal to, are defined as follows, gamma is equal to two and rho is equal to one. And later, we use a more careful approach to select the preference parameters that produce the best, the best out of sample prediction performance for the GLBs. These preference parameters we assume here are, are, are reasonable values that are consistent for the values of gamma and rho that has been used in the literature. Most of the asset price in literature agrees that gamma is typically between one and 10, and rho, which is um, preference for skewness, is typically greater than or equal to one. Now, with these preference parameters, we compute the set of betas using past daily returns for one year period. And then we use these betas and preference parameters to determine the set of theta that gives the GLB for different maturities. What you see here is a summary statistics of our um, generalized lower bound measure. Now focusing on the 30 days horizon, column names show different maturities of options used to compute this GLP, which is also the horizon of the expected return in question. You can see that, so these, these generalized lower bounds are all analyzed. You see that on average, the GLP is about 88% per annum. The 5%, the 5 percentile is about 2%, and the 95th percentile is about 20%, which means for and the results is also quite similar for different maturities, you see here. What this means is that for the, about 90% of stocks and time periods in our sample, the conditionally expected SS return or the generalized lower bound for the conditionally expected SS return of individual stocks varies between a 2% and 20% per annum window. And you can see from the column theta that the theta that gives the maximum lower bound is around 0.5, which shows that the GLB is basically the ratio of two risk neutral moments of degree 1.5 and degree 0.5, given the definition of the functions in the GLB. Here I show the time series and the time structure of the generalized lower bounds. And you can see from panel A, here we plot the time series in panel A, you see that the gray areas, which are the end bar recession dates, we have a huge spike, particularly during the 2007-2008 financial crisis in the generalized lower bounds, which is consistent with the idea that in bad times, expected returns tend to spike. And for the time structure, so here we define term structure as you know, the, the, the pattern in the expected returns for different, holding, for different holding periods or time horizon. And you can see that in the X axis, we plot 30 days horizon, 91 days, 182 days and 365 days. In the left axis, which are the blue lines, we plot for the full sample and boom periods. And in the left axis, we plot the average annualized lower bound conditional on recession periods. You see that in general, the term structure is downward sloping and much more so during recession periods. And this is consistent with papers that have shown 
that um, the, that investors tend to value short term, tend to perceive short term cash flow risk as more risky. Well, short term cash flow shocks um, as more risky than longer term cash flow shocks. And also papers that have shown that the risk premium or the expected returns tend to be pronouncedly downward sloping in bad times. Here we show how the generalized lower bound varies across different stock characteristics. So basically we form, quinta, we form deci portfolios based on market beta, size, book to market ratio, and implied variance. These Portfolios are rebalanced um, monthly, and we compute equally weighted average generalized lower bounds for these different portfolios. You can see for market beta that there is a clear upward trend moving from low beta to high beta in our measure of expected return or generalized lower bound. For size, there is a downward, slope, downward trend. For implied variance, we have an upward trend. For book to market ratio, there is not there is no clear relationship. Now, at least for market beta and implied variance, one can easily see roughly that the low risk anomaly or the low beta anomaly, which has been widely documented in the literature does not obtain when one uses our measure of expected return. Now, we now ask, does our measure of the, does the GLB, which is indeed a lower bound, provide an unbiased proxy for the expected return? Basically, can we use the GLB as a measure of expected return itself, in the sense that it is tight? And we do that using two approaches. First, we do an unconditional tightness test, and we also do a conditional validity and tightness test. To do the unconditional tightness test, we basically run several time series regressions for each stock, basically for each stock and for a given horizon, 30 days, 90 days, 182 days on 365 days. We run this time series regression and we test the, no, the joint no hypothesis that beta zero is equal to zero and beta one is equal to one. In this table, we show the distribution of the p-values for the different investment horizon you can see here for the 30 days that the, at the 10th percentile of the p-values is about is slightly greater than 5%, which shows that for less than, we only reject this null hypothesis, the unconditional tightness test for less than 10% of the stocks. If you increase the investment horizon to about 365 days, you see that we reject the unconditional tightness test for between um, that 35% to 50% of the stocks. Now, the rejection rate is much smaller for the 91 days than 182 days. And what one can take out of this table is that for the vast majority of the stocks, our generalized lower bound provides a tight proxy for this conditionally expected SS return of individual stocks. And this is much more so for shorter maturity horizons, say 30, 91 days. Now, to reinforce this result, we also, like I said, do a conditional- so could, I, could, could I interrupt you and, and maybe we should take some questions from the chat before you go too much okay. further? Yeah. Um, so your, your co-authors were answering some of the questions, but uh, I'll, I'll sort of combine several questions and, and ask them in the form of one. There were a lot of questions about estimation error in estimating the risk neutral moments, right? So why, why should we be confident that you've accurately estimated the risk neutral moments and thus accurately estimated the lower bounds? So basically for the risk neutral moments, we follow standard approaches. Like I showed you, we use the spanning formula and um, also, if one is, you know, if the question is really about, um, say, the quality of the data we are using, like I said, we are using the um, volatility surface data. We use standard filters that has been variously used in the literature. And I don't see why. I mean, I don't see. I don't see the problem 
with the risk neutral moments that we are feeding into the lower bound measure. Okay, let me ask a question about this slide. Yeah. So I think you're saying, I think you're trying to tell us that your method is good. I'll simplify yeah. a little bit because you don't reject the null of beta equal to one. But right, yeah. but failure to reject the null can be a power issue. So uh, actually, I just noticed that Dean was asking the same question in the chat. Failure to reject the null can be a power issue. You know, what's the average value of beta in these regressions? So basically for this, um, for each of these regressions, I think we restrict um, the, the, the stocks to those that have at least three years of monthly data. And I quite agree that, you know, failure to reject is, um, could be due to lack of power. This, that is why we actually do an additional test for tightness, which is the conditional tightness test I was going to show you in the next slide. What we try to do there is also to, so there we use a larger sample. I mean, we use, we, we use a pooled um, panel approach, which, you know, gives more sample size. And we also test it for different groups of stocks to see if there are quite some buckets of stocks where the tightness is actually not um, being satisfied. But what, what, what's, the, what's the value of beta one in these regressions? What's the point estimate? Um, so beta, beta one is typically um, somewhere between say 0 0.8 and 1.5. I can't remember exactly, but it's somewhere around these numbers. And remember that here, we are not just testing that beta is equal to one. This is a joint test that beta zero is equal to zero and beta one is equal to one. Okay, I should, I should let you move on rather than chew up too much of your time. Okay. So, um, you know, now to the conditional test that I mentioned earlier. Again, this test is, you know, to try to ameliorate some of these shortcomings of the previous test that I showed in the previous slide. And basically here we adapt the joint test for inequalities developed in Code and Farm 1986 econometrica and Volak 1989 general of econometrics. Now this test has also been applied in Bodoc et al. 1993 to test the positivity of S anteris premium. Now to apply this test to our framework, one begins with by realizing that our theory suggests that the following inequality holds, which is that um, the difference between the realized future return and the GLB is greater than or equal to zero conditionally. Now to test this, one needs to restrict the conditional expectation to a set, to a set of observable um, information set and we focus on a set of conditioning information variables called ZT, strictly greater than zero. Now, if you multiply the left-hand side and the right-hand side of this inequality by Z, and you use the law of iterated expectation to condition this down as follows. Now, call the left-hand side expectation mu. Now, this is a vector of expectations. And the conditional validity test here implies testing the null that this vector of expectations is greater than or equal to zero versus the alternative that it is it belongs in RK. And the conditional tightness test is equivalent to the null that mu is equal to zero versus the alternative that it is greater than or equal to zero. Now to apply this test to our framework, we use a panel data of quintile portfolios sorted on one of three characteristics. So basically, we found different quintile portfolios, either with market size, market beta size or book to market ratio. And for conditioning variables, we use a set of conditioning variables, three sets of conditioning variables from Goya and Welch 2008. The first set is stock variance, net equity issuance and inflation. The second set is treasury bill, stamp spread and default yield. And the third one is dividend price ratio NS price ratio and book to market ratio. Now we compute the test statistics and the p values of the null hypothesis that I showed you previously using the approach de described in Volat 1989. Now, the main outcome from this test is that 
for all conditioning variable set and all portfolio set, the GLB is a valid expected return bound across all horizons. Also, also the GLB is a tight proxy for expected conditional expected for the conditional expected SS return of individual stocks, mostly for shorter investment horizons. But we also, you know, fail to reject the null for several sets of conditioning variables for higher maturities. Now, here I summarize the results I just described. Here you see the conditioning variable set we use for the test. And this column shows you that we are testing the validity results for the validity test. And here you have the results for the tightness test. Here you have the horizon in question. And this tells you the portfolio set in question, whether beta sorted portfolios, book to market or size portfolios. Now you can, in parentheses, you have the P values for these tests. And you can see that only in these red cases, which is for the 182 days and 365 days maturity that we do reject the tightness test. For all other cases, we do not reject the validity and the tightness test. Again, this goes to show that in general, one can take our lower bound measure as a good proxy for the expected return for the conditional expected SS return of individual stocks. But to be more um, conservative, this measure is much more robust for shorter maturities. Now, having shown that the GLB is a good proxy for the conditional expected SS return for individual stocks, one would like to know whether they are good predictors of future realized returns of individual stocks. And we do this following two approaches, first cross-sectionally and also in the time series relative to different benchmarks. What you see here is um, the annualized equally weighted future realized returns for different quintile portfolios sorted on the GLBs for the 30 days, 91 days, and 182 and 365 days maturity. In the last row of the table, you have the P value for the monotonicity relation test of Patton and Timmerman 2010. Now, focusing on the 30 days, you can see that we have a clear pattern of increasing average returns for the GLB sorted quintile portfolios. There is only one case, which is the 91 days maturity, where we reject the null of non, where we fail to reject the null of non monotonicity no. at conventional significance level. Now, in the time series, we also try to look whether the GLB is a good predictor of future returns relative to several benchmarks, and in particular to benchmarks of, to the benchmark of Martin and Wagner, which is the Martin and Wagner measure of individual expected return, and the measure of individual expected SS return of Cardan and Tang. Now, what you see here is for the benchmark is the average realized return of the stock. Here we use as benchmark 6% per annum as, um, as the expected return for a stock. Here we use as benchmark average, historical average return of the market. Here we use historical average implied variance of the market. Here we use average implied variance of the stock. And here we multiply each of these previously defined measures by the market beta. What you see in the values are um, the out of sample R squared relative to these benchmarks in percent. And in the parentheses, you have the P values computed using block bootstrap procedure. Now you have the results for different horizons. You see that in all cases here, except for this one case, the out of sample R squared relative to this benchmark is positive. And for the vast majority of the benchmarks, we are also, the out of sample R squared is also significant. Now, what this shows us is that not only are the GLBs good in predicting returns in the cross section, they are also very good predictors in the time series and perform much, much better than current um, uh, measures that have been um, derived in the literature and also to several other benchmarks in the literature. Now, we also show that these are performance relative to several benchmarks is not dominated by some small group of, from, for some certain group of stocks. And to do this, we try, we sort stocks into different portfolios 
into, a, into different SI portfolios based on market beta. And we compute this out of sample R squares for these different um, portfolios. In the figure, the panel level show the benchmark in question. In the left axis, we plot the out of sample R squared relative to the benchmark in percent. And in the right axis, we plot the P values. The red line is um, the 10% significance level. And you can see that across the portfolios and across different benchmarks, there is only one case where the out of sample R squared is negative. And also, there is no systematic pattern in the um, outperformance. And also importantly, the p-values are mostly below the 10% um, significance level. Again, this goes to further reinforce the idea that our bound is a, is a good predictor relative to these other benchmarks. Now, here we try to see how our bounds, um, how different higher moments of the risk neutral distribution affect our measure of expected returns. And the summary is that volatility, skewness, and kurtosis have important effects. In good times, and this effect also depends on the economic regime, in good times, a one standard deviation shock to volatility increases the generalized lower bound or our expected return measure by 80% of its standard deviation. For skewness, it declines by about 8%, and for, skew, uh, for kurtosis, it increases by about 6.5%. Now, in recession, the effect of volatility dec declines to 51%. Skewness increases in absolute value to 26%, and also um, kurtosis increases in absolute value by to 68%, but the sign flips. Again, this goes to for show that these higher moments play a crucial role to our measure of expected return. And now we take our measure of expected return to several economic applications. First, we try to see how individual stock expected return behave across the FOMC meeting cycle, basically the Federal Open Market Committee meeting days, and also on the even weeks of the Federal Open Market Committee. Now, several papers have shown that on FOMC meeting days, there is huge drop in the market risk premium. And also this comes from the fact that on these days we have resolution of uncertainty. And CISLAC et al. shows that this result also obtains on even weeks because these weeks um, coincide with um, the timeline that the Fed conducts several of its monetary policy actions. So what we try to see is whether these results that have been documented for the market also obtains for individual stocks and also how heterogeneous the effect is. We begin by first looking at daily changes on the, our, our measure of expected general, on our measure of conditionally expected SS return and try to see how it changes on, FOM, on FOMC meeting days and on the even weeks of the, F, of, the FOMC, of the FOMC cycle. Now the even weeks are defined as week zero, week two, week four, and week six, where week zero begins from the day before the meeting and ends um, four days after the meeting. I mean, ends, yeah, four days after the meeting. And what you can clearly see here is that on the, so what we run here is a put panel regression across all stocks. And what you can see here is that on the day of the meeting, there is a huge drop on the, um, on, for the GLBs. So expected returns draw strongly on the day of the FOMC meeting, and also on average on the even weeks of the FOMC cycle. And this even week effect is dominated by week zero. Now this is quite similar with what six like and others have shown for the market risk premium. However, you see here that the effect for individual stock is quite strong. Here we also plot the, um, you know, the, changes in the GLB over the whole FOMC cycle. So here, what we plot on the y-axis is weekly changes in the GLB, and in the x-axis is the number of days since the FOMC meeting. And you can see that on the zero, so we plot, we plot the equally weighted average across stocks and the value weighted average. And you see that on the zero, there is a huge drop in the expected returns. So this is on week zero because it's um, 
this is a one week change in the GLB. And this also obtains for more or less other even weeks, but the effect is dominated for week zero. Now, we also, we then ask what characteristics of individual stocks affect or determine how these stocks respond to federal, to monetary policy news. Now, we begin by first sorting daily changes um, of the GLBs on FOMC meeting days on stock characteristics. We find um, that there is a huge dependence on market beta. So um, high beta stocks experience large drop on the expected returns on FOMC meeting days. Also the same for um, stocks with high implied variance. Also high order moments play a role. But we know that the effect of these characteristics can be nonlinear and there could be huge interaction effects. We try to use a machine learning algorithm in particular random forest to try to account for these nonlinearities and interactions and extract um, and a future importance measure that ranks the importance of each of these characteristics in determining how a stock's expected return changes on FOMC meeting days. So what you see here is that on the red, the red bars show the characteristics that play a huge role, the largest roles. And you see that the higher order moments, variance, kutosis, and volatility are among the top contributing factors or characteristics. Also, you see that beta is among. We also have other characteristics such as liquidity, dividend yield, size, and so on. Now, the important thing to take away from this is that high order moments and several other characteristics are important in how these stocks respond to macroeconomic news, which again, you know, um, you know, justifies our inclusion of these higher moments or incorporation of these higher moments in our measure of generalized lower bound. Now, what you see here is a sorting of daily changes of um, expected return of individual stock expected return on a measure of composites on a composite sensitivity measure, which we derive from our machine learning algorithm from this random random forest classifier. We, we generate a measure a sensitivity index that we use to sort stocks on on each FOMC meeting day. So what you see here on the x-axis, one is low sensitivity to FOMC meeting news, and five is high sensitivity. You see that stocks that have low sensitivity to FOMC meeting news experience actually an increase in their expected return on FOMC meeting days, whereas stocks that have high sensitivity to FOMC meeting news experience strong decline. On non-FOMC meeting days, there is not a pattern in the daily changes in the generalized lower bound. On the even and odd weeks, we also have a clear pattern, but the pattern is not as strong for the changes in expected return on the FOMC meeting days. So before you, let me interrupt. Before you leave the random forest, oh, um, a, a question from Francois Kokoma. Uh, mm -hmm. It seems that by and large, the most important characteristics in the random forest are the most yeah. variable or responsive ones. Yeah, so could you say the last word again? It seems that by and large, the most important yeah. characteristics in the random forest are the most variable characteristics. Well, it seems so, but we also have characteristics such as um, yeah, I agree with you that implied variance are quite variable, beta are quite variable, but we also have other characteristics such as dividend yield, um, PEG trailing, and CAPE. But yeah, I mean, part of this could be that some of this other information is a bit lagged, but it is not the only explanation. Okay, so, um, the bottom line of this is that individual stocks have heterogeneous response to FOMC news in terms of how their expected returns um, adjust to monetary policy news. Now, we also take the expected return measure to the widely used cross-sectional, um, widely used asset pricing test, which is the form of Macbeth regression. So basically, we try to see how firm characteristics relates to their expected returns. 
Now, you see here for different horizons, 30 days, 91 days, 182 days, and 365 days, you see that beta, which is market beta, is strongly priced with a positive sign of about 4% per annum. And this is consistent across different maturities. Now, this is quite interesting because you see here that with our expected return measure, the low risk anomaly, which is that high beta stocks or more risky stocks tend to have lower expected returns, does not hold. So we have a positive market risk premium, although it's not as high as the 6% or the 7% that is generally estimated from historical data, it is still encouraging, even that it's quite sizable and also positive. We also see that characteristics such as size, book to market ratio, profitability, no, I mean, momentum is priced. Profitability is also priced. Investment is not, um, I mean, investment is also priced, but profitability is not always priced, only at the 30 days maturity. Now, the next exercise we do or the next application is now to try to extract the preference parameters that produce the best performing expected return measure. Remember that we started by assuming that rho and gamma is equal to one and two. Here we now try to look at this, here we try to compute the expected return measure across a grid of gammas and also across a grid of rows and compute the, um, the mean squared error out of sample mean squared error for the 30 days and 365 days maturity. So here in this heat map, the lighter areas are lower mean squared error. And um, the, the darker areas are larger mean squared. So you see that for the 30 days maturity, gamma rho does not play a huge role because there is not much variability across rho. Gamma plays a huge role, the same for the 365 days. Here you see for the 30 days that the gamma of about 2.0 and 3.0 produce the best out of sample performance. For 365 days, we also find similar range of gamma values. Now we do similar exercise, but now doing the out of sample performance, doing the out of sample analysis relative to specific benchmarks. So in the X axis, we plot different values of rho and now we fix, I mean, different values of gamma. And now we fix rho equal to one because like I showed in the previous slide, rho does not play a huge role. And we compute the out of sample R squared relative to um, three benchmarks, beta times uh, markets, historical markets average return, beta times implied variance of the market and the expect conditional expected SS return measure of Martin and Wagner. Now you see that gamma of 2.25 produce the best out of sample performance relative to these benchmarks for the 30 days horizon. And this does not vary across different benchmarks. And gamma of 2.5 produces um, the best out performance for 365 days. But you can see again that gamma values around the values around the, within the range I showed you in the previous slide does not produce very different results for the out of sample performance. We also show in, in some robustness tests that using average values of gamma across, um, using average GLB for different values of gamma, average GLB for different values of gamma also produce similar results. So the results is not so sensitive for values at or outside of the range I showed you previously. Now, <clears throat> some extras and extensions of our result all results that I've showed you um, previously depends on a second order Taylor series approximation of the set that gives an, um, a lower bound. However, one could ask if these results still hold when one considers higher order Taylor series expansion, and we explore that possibility. So we consider a, a case where we, we try to um, you know, define the set of theta that gives the generalized lower bound through a third order Taylor series approximation. The third order Taylor series approximation introduces an additional parameter in computing the set of theta, and this parameter is the preference for kurtosis. We show that for reasonable values of this kurtosis parameter, 
the, the out of the the third order generalized lower bound marginally outperforms the second order generalized lower bound in out of sample performance but the the, the, the improvement is very marginal which makes us think that it makes more sense to restrict attention to the second order approximation, given the complexity involved in using the third order stellar series approximation to compute these generalized lower bounds. We also use these third order GLBs to do um, validity and tightness tests, and we find that the results are quite robust. Like I also mentioned earlier, we also try to address model uncertainty by looking at how the GLB is performed when we compute them across a grid of rows, gammas, and kappa for the third order GLB, and use the average as a measure of conditionally expected SS return. We find that this average expected return across preference parameters performs similarly, as I've shown you in the uh, previous slides, which means that these results I've shown you is quite robust to um, sensitivity of this preference parameter. So if one does not, if one is not so confident of making as, an assumption about preference parameters, one can compute them across a grid of preference parameters and use the average value as a measure of conditional expected SS return. We also derive the GLB for log returns, which is useful for in cases where people prefer to work um, with log returns instead of simple returns. And we also find that the results that I've shown you previously also holds for these um, log return based generalized lower bounds. Overall, we show that the results are very robust. And in conclusion, we have used quite um, less restrictive, restrictive assumptions to derive a generalized lower bound for the conditional expected SS return of individual stocks. And we show that these bounds are tight in the sense that they can be used as a direct proxy for the conditional expected SS return of individual stocks. We show that these bounds depend strongly on higher order risk neutral moments and they perform well in out of sample um, prediction and much more so relative to several benchmarks that have been used in the literature. And we show that these measures of conditional expected SS return of individual stocks are very useful in several economic applications. Thank you very much for your audience. All right, thank you. Um, there were, so right now, um, anyone who has questions should feel free to unmute themselves and ask them on the microphone. Uh, Chooks, there were, there were a lot of questions and I didn't interrupt you very much because there were a lot of questions in the chat, but your, your co-authors were, and it seemed to me your co-authors were answering them very effectively. So I didn't, I didn't answer, I didn't interrupt you very much. Um, there was actually one kind of outstanding question that you never addressed. Um, do you have any results comparing your expected return bounds um, to the bounds or estimates of Martin and Madan? And Martin Wagner. Martin, Martin Wagner, Martin, I'm sorry. Yes, so I mentioned this a couple of times. So first, if you look at this picture, to this at this table, this is the out of sample performance relative to Martin and Wagner. Okay, and I'm sorry, I missed it. I'm sorry. Yes. And again, in this picture, you also see it. So the, the green dotted line is the out of sample error squared relative to Martin and Wagner. But if so I can indeed, our measure strongly outperforms that of Martin and Wagner and also that of Cardan and Tom. Just very quickly, just one second, I want to add. So in the paper, we have much more of a comparison between our GLB and Martin Wagner. So we basically put the difference into the Fama Macbeth framework to see which moments actually define the difference. And then we also use some sortings to see which, for which portfolios we especially under, underperform or outperform. So it's all in the paper, but I guess uh, Chuksi didn't have time to talk about it. All right, any other questions? 
I mean, can I ask a quick one? So actually it would be like really useful to have some good economic interpretation for the method because it's just this kind of a black, has this black boxy feeling to me. And uh, you guys are sophisticated, I'm not. Uh, and it's very difficult for me to explain this measure to my say uh, undergrad students and so on. <laughs> so I mean, the easy way to think about it is, first of all, we know that um, we know how you know the literature has moved to recover physical distributions from option prices. First of all, we know that option prices are very important because they provide a lot of conditional information that um, several market participants use in forming in, you know informing their trades. So we use when we use information from option prices. First of all, is that these, these um, option prices already aggregates a lot of information that is used by market participants. And this information is basically reflected in our measure. Now, more directly, you see that our measure, like I showed you in, um, with an illustration, it can be written as a weighted sum of several higher order moments of the risk neutral distribution. Now, a lot of papers have shown that the conditional higher moments, um, conditional higher moments are highly sensitive to disaster risk. And we know that a lot of papers have been written about the determinants of expected returns and disaster risk is one of these important things that have been highlighted. And these conditional moments, like I, I, I showed earlier, you know, our measure can be, can be seen as a, as a weighted sum of these higher order moments. I mean, if I can add, for me, it would be useful to see some kind of like common test that people do, just sort stocks based on your expected measure, uh, then compute 10 minus one, show me the time yeah. series 1996 to 2000, whatever option metrics is. So this way I can see where the abnormal returns that are generated by this expected return measure are concentrated, right? So. Yeah, you could, yeah, yeah. So kind of like resu simple results that are easy to interpret like this would be useful. Okay. Yeah, I think you you're, know, you're I, right. Hello? Yeah, go ahead. Hello? Go ahead. We yeah, can hear I you. think, yeah, that's a, that's a good, a good uh, comment. Yeah, that's a good comment. So uh, we can do that. Um, I think it's important to know that first, uh, the literature has moved a little bit. Uh, uh, from uh, using historical data and making time series assumptions to compute uh, physical moments. And uh, from Ross recovery, uh, now we are, you know, we are seeing papers using option prices to recover the physical equity return. Uh, for the market, if you use the market, it's pretty sim not simple, but several papers have done that. And the difficult part is how do you, how do you translate this and uh, compute the expected excess return on individual stock? This is not an easy task. We cannot just say that, okay, this stochastic so discount factor is a function of individual stock return only. This would be a problem. So uh, we, we, we need to justify this. So that's why we, uh, we provide a simple way uh, that allows us to, to put a bound on the expected excess return and show later on that is time. So our approach has several advantages. Uh, the first one is that we don't need any historic, we don't need, we do not need to make time series assumptions or use uh, data, uh, historical data uh, to get uh, uh, the bounce from option prices. And second, our bound is very informative. So we, you can see that we, have, we are quite innovative a little bit in terms of testing uh, if our bound is tight. If you look at several papers in the literature, uh, it's just a simple regression all papers are running to test if beta is equal to one and alpha A is equal to zero. So here we, uh, we provide two tests, one which is unconditional, one which is also conditional. So this way we can convince our readers that you know, this bound that we compute is not just something random, something that contains a lot of information about the expected return itself. And it could be useful you know, for uh, in for practical purposes, uh, in the audience that uh, we should sort, uh, we can sort, you know, stocks based on uh, do some sorting using our measure. Uh, I'm quite in, uh, in this respect. Uh, I think that's all I have to say.
for now. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, my point was more is, are you guys reinventing IV skew and IV spread? So we already know that IV skew and spread predict future returns. So we can take IV, I can take a, like, I don't know, like an average of IV spread and IV skew and call it a, my expected return measure. No, we, we give you unbiased uh, predictors, right? So we basically yeah, give you so one. I, I, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. We Go give ahead. you unbiased right. predictor of expected return, e, not only the cross section, right? Because there are many predictors in the cross section of stocks. We give you a time series predictor for each particular stock. It's not just working like high uh, value of characteristics outperform slow value of characteristics. No, it's different, right? It is unbiased, it's predictor for each individual stock, expected return, and it is conditional. So that's why. I mean, also we provide theoretical motivation why this is indeed you know, a measure of expected return. You know, we move from a bound, and then empirically we show that it's also a good project. So not just um, doing something ad hoc. Now you're on mute. All right, thanks very much. Are there any other questions? I guess we're very efficient answering them in the chat. Hey, there you go. <laughs> so anyway, so um, <laughs> talking about the chat, so Dimitri will send you guys the chat uh, sometime later this afternoon. So